Today's reading is from Paul's Epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 16 to 27. Starting with verse 16 in chapter 8, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But we hope for what we do not see. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he searches, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And there's a second reading uh, today from the Gospel of Mark. And chapter 14, verses 32 to 41. So from the 14th chapter of Mark, starting with verse 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul was very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. On here. All right, I need everybody to put on your best cardboard face. <laughs> That's what I'm used to preaching to for the past uh, three months. <laughs> this is different. I don't mention is it weird not to be able to actually see the expressions on your faces with these masks. I feel like I'm preaching in some dystopian... Uh... <laughs> and not to mention, it's the first time I've preached in long pants in a little while. So <laughs> this, is, this is new. Uh, this is uh, yeah, strange and difficult on multiple levels. I can't just go shut the camera off when I make a mistake and start it back over. So, well, yeah, we'll see if we can if we can do this and get through this. Um, but so, yeah, for the summer, what we're doing here in our sermon series is we're preaching uh, through the series on growing in grace, uh, which is a series, a uh, very practical 
series intended to kind of walk us through uh, just these very simple but very time-tested uh, spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines that the church has used throughout history to kind of enable us to grow in, deeper in our love for who Christ is, uh, but also to grow in our just enjoyment and effectiveness as well, too, in the life that uh, Jesus calls us to uh, together. And so last week, uh, we were looking at the, the discipline of prayer, and in particular, we were looking at the discipline of kingdom prayer, like praying in such a way that we are cultivating in ourselves this really deep desire for God's kingdom to come and his will, as it is happening in heaven, to be done here on earth, and sort of posturing ourselves before him in prayer in such a way, too, that we're cultivating not only a desire for his kingdom to come, but also this passionate desire to be a part of that and to be used uh, by God however he would so desire to see that kingdom be advanced and his will to be done around us. And, and so uh, when I was uh, preparing that sermon last week, I had intended all along to spend a good deal of time talking about the importance of lamenting in prayer, in, in kingdom prayers. Uh, but then when it came time, finally put the sermon together and start preaching it, like it, it was already too long, and I didn't want to overwhelm the memory card and the camera, so that section sort of got cut. And I thought that today we would be moving on to the next discipline, uh, but just throughout the week, I just kept coming back to, you know, just the importance of stopping and taking time to lament and to grieve uh, in our prayers. Uh, even my own prayers throughout the week had more a, of a tone of lament to it, so it just was starting to feel very unnatural to move on. And so that's what we're doing today. We're, we're talking still about prayer, kingdom prayer, but we're talking about the importance of during that prayer to stop and to allow a time to, to lament and to grieve or as our passage in Romans will talk about, to actually groan uh, together. You know, if you think about it, uh, it's, you know, it's a a really wonderful thing that uh, God would invite us to come and to lament and to grieve and to be raw with our emotions, with our sadness, our frustrations, our agonies before him. Uh, That's a real privilege of Christian faith and coming to the God that we serve. Uh, But again, in particular, I want to just stress that what I'm, I'm going after today is the importance of how lament actually helps us grow in our longing for his kingdom and helps cultivate that desire to be a part of that. All right, so if I could just give a couple quick initial reasons why lamenting is good, we'll talk more about it later. You know, one is that when we lament, right, when we stop and we consider the ways that the world is not yet right, that God's kingdom and his purposes are being resisted in the neighborhoods and the communities and the families that we're a part of, uh, that his good and beautiful intentions for creation are, are being frustrated in some way. Like when we would lament that and we stop and consider that, um, it should cultivate in us this, this greater desire that, that kingdom would come. I think of Nate Biermus back there, uh, poor guy when he was uh, <laughs> uh, having his his bout with corona and COVID, uh, you know, he, he would say he didn't have it too bad, but in my mind he had it pretty bad because he lost his sense of taste, <laughs> right? So I imagine him eating things, and he can't quite taste the way it normally. I can imagine a poor guy trying to eat a cheesesteak or something, and he can't quite taste it the way it is, and I would imagine that would elicit some groaning uh, because, uh, you know, he knows the way it should be, and he knows the way it's not, and he's probably groaning and longing for the day. Uh, when the taste would come back and he can enjoy it and so forth, which I assume you're, you're, you're back to that, Nate. You're all good? Good. <laughs> right, so it's, it's that idea that when we stop and we lament the things that are not right and we sit in that discomfort, it, it stirs in us this, this deep longing for things to be made right, for God's kingdom to come, for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's one reason. That's probably the main reason we're looking at it. Uh, another reason, and I'll just say this, you know, for those of you who have been tracking listening, trying to understand uh, some of the really deep cultural conversations that are taking place, some of the conversations that we're having as a church here as well around this cultural moment. Uh, I'm hearing from some, okay, so I'm listening, I'm trying to understand, so the question is, well, what do we do? Or I know that we have a few uh, smaller groups right now, book studies that are diving deeper into this whole question of racial injustice and trying to understand the systemic side of it and things. And, and I know that as you dive deeper into that, the questions are going to be coming, okay, so what do we do to fix this problem? You know, if you were there Sunday night, Andrew put it really well in the Q&A afterwards, how do we unbrew this tea that has been brewed over the years, right? And uh, to that, 
I, I would just say that one very effective thing that we can do is to just stop and lament. Right? Sometimes the, uh, the compulsion to action is actually, just, is actually because we, we, we don't want to sit in the discomfort of it. Like when Amy comes to me with a problem uh, or whatever, I immediately go into fix-it mode. And I immediately think, okay, how are we going to solve this problem? And so I want to hastily run, because mainly I don't want to sit in the discomfort of the problem. Right? But sometimes what is good and beneficial is just to stop, to grieve, uh, and to lament. We'll talk maybe a little bit more about that later. But perhaps... The last reason, maybe the most serious reason why I want to talk about lamenting is I, I'm not so sure that naturally we're all that good at it. And I would submit as evidence A to the jury <laughs> that if you look in the Bible, right, the Bible's prayer and worship book, the Psalms, right, the material that God gave for his people to pray and to worship and sing individually and corporately uh, is probably 60 to 65 percent lament. Right? You read through the Psalms and you know that. Uh, by contrast, if I ask what percentage of our worship songs, our choruses, or even our hymn books are songs of lament, I don't know, fuzzy, two, three percent, maybe? <laughs> That's why I'm a big advocate for uh, not rushing through the season of Advent before we get to Christmas, because it, actually it's in Advent that we get the closest thing to hymns and choruses of lament, because we're asking how long, you know, and all that, Right? So again, think about that. That's striking. 60 to 65% of the Bible's prayer book is lament. <laughs> our hymn books, our worship roster, maybe 2 3% of lament. You know, and you stop and you wonder, okay, so why is that? Why is it we're just not prone to lamenting so much? Uh, and part of it, maybe to put it positively, could be, you know, that for some of us, lamenting sounds like complaining. And we think, well, what right do we have to complain to God, right? Especially in light of how he's been so gracious and kind to us in Christ. Uh, it's quite possible that part of the reason we don't lament worship is maybe because of all of our worship leaders, not here, but uh, maybe in the, across the church, are guys. And guys notoriously or stereotypically are not all that uh, thrilled to dive deep into their motions, unless you're Pastor Tim. <laughs> and you're good at that. Or maybe it's just me. Maybe it's the problem it's just me. I get scared by intense emotions, and so I, I try to ward that off and rather sing happy songs. I don't know. Okay, or, and this would just be the last question that I would have. I wonder, and others have wondered too, if the reason we don't lament is, well, so on one level, right, theologically, we wouldn't agree with the health and wealth and prosperity gospel. Right? You give your life to Jesus and he makes your life all roses. Right? We don't agree with that theologically. But I wonder if possibly we have subtly absorbed and bought into the cultural notion that the measure of life is how happy and healthy and maybe even wealthy and comfortable you are. Such that right, feelings of despair, loneliness, depression, agonies, frustration, you know, all these things would be maybe signs of weakness uh, or maybe things that just get in the way of us wanting to experience comfort and peace and happiness and joy. I'm going to quote um, Carl Truman here, uh, mainly because he uses a lot of big words and I don't get to use big words in my sermons all that much, but he says this, in the Psalms, God has given the church a language which allows it to express even the deepest agonies of the human soul in the context of worship. And he says, does our contemporary language of worship reflect that horizon of expectation regarding the believer's experience, which the Psalter would regard as normative? And if not, why not? Is it because, he asked, the comfortable values of Western middle-class consumerism have silently infiltrated the church and made us consider such cries irrelevant, embarrassing, and maybe even signs of abject uh, failure? So that's part of the concern. So we're going to dive in. But I guess what I would just say in the, in the beginning here, if your desire is just instant comfort, peace, happiness, contentness, contentment, don't sit and lament, right? Because lament will stir discomfort. Uh, but, you know, if your desire is this greater passion to see God's kingdom come 
and to cultivate in you an even deeper desire and willingness to be a part of that kingdom coming, whatever the cost, then I would suggest to you that lament, I would suggest the Bible suggests to you that lament uh, is a very necessary and important ingredient uh, in that. Okay? So that's what we're looking at today. To make the case, we're primarily in Romans chapter 8. Uh, this great passage, super loaded theologically, and we can't dive in and pick it all apart, right? I'll probably, don't worry, I probably preach through this text once a year. <laughs> so well, we'll come back around to it. I more am interested in, in you seeing just big picture concepts here uh, from the Apostle Paul in Romans 8. Uh, and just think about how he starts this passage, right? Very familiar line. I consider that the present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that is yet to be revealed in us. Okay, for Paul, he's driven by glory. What is it that motivates us to faithful, perhaps sacrificial service in the present? Or what is even the blueprint at times? What are we aiming for in our service? Man, it's this glorious future that is yet to come, this glorious future that has been secured for us in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? A glorious future where we are full participants in the resurrection life that Jesus wrestled from the grave. Right? That glorious future where there's no more tears and sadness and coronaviruses and you know, sickness and decay. Uh, a glorious future where, you know, man, it's always so great to talk about this, where all of creation is being restored and renewed and is submitted to the beautiful intentions of the King. A glorious new creation where hidden systemic inequalities uh, and injustices are nowhere to be found anymore, right? Or a glorious future where there's no more sin, there's no more personal shame, there's no more personal guilt, right? This incredible future, this is what motivates Paul, this is what for him motivates him in some ways to say the present sufferings, whatever, we can work through that because look what we've got coming, Okay? But the obvious other part of the story for Paul is that we're not there yet. Right? It's future. <laughs> it's not our present reality. Uh, we are a people en route to that. We are a people in progress or in process towards that. We are a people who are waiting for that. Uh, so for Paul, uh, it would be like the writer of Hebrews who compares the church to, uh, to the Israelites in the wilderness, right? who've just been delivered from bondage and oppression in Egypt. They've just been given this great salvation. They've got this glorious land of promise that is yet to come, but in, the, in between time, they've got this wilderness that they have to venture through. You know, in a wilderness which is not the way life and creation is supposed to be. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable, right? It's hard, but yet it's a place where God meets them and he strengthens them with his presence and his grace. Or, think the way Peter talks about the church. You know, Peter will call the church, uh, he'll use exile language when he talks to the church, and he'll liken the church's situation to when the Israelites were in exile, when they lost their home, when they were kicked out of their home, and then they found themselves strangers in this foreign land that had very little concern for what God's purposes for, or his kingdom were all about. And so they were suffering through that. They were waiting and longing. They had the voices of the prophets that were saying to them, hey, God has not abandoned you. He will return to you with his salvation and the restoration of this kingdom. And yet they were waiting as exiles in this strange and uncomfortable land. <laughs> Can you hear our kids screaming over in the side? It's good. Where was I? Thanks, Jeffrey. <laughs> All right, so it's that picture. that There were this church that... Uh, we're in the in-between. And for Paul, for the writer of Hebrews, for the writer of Peter, the in-between is, is this time of tension. It's this time of angst. Right? The glorious future hasn't yet come into the present. Uh, we've been rescued and redeemed. We can taste it. We can see it. But there's this angst. There's this tension uh, that we experience right here and right now. Maybe I would say just real quickly here. So this is part of our whatever you want to call it, luxury of living in Western, middle-class, suburban America, is that we have become kind of good at mitigating some of that tension and discomfort, maybe bringing in some of that future glory more into the present right now. And so maybe at times we don't really feel that tension and that angst, but we don't want to lose sight of what Paul's saying here, that we're in this in-between time where there is this tension and, there's, and this angst. Okay, so... Glorious future, 
in between time, and then here's the last part of the passage, what is the voice, what is the language, what is the expression of the in between time? Right? What's the word that's repeated most often in the passage? You pick it up. It's groaning. If you picked it up there in Romans 8, what is everything doing in this in-between time while we're waiting on future glory? Everything is groaning. All of creation is groaning. It's groaning as in the, uh, the pains of childbirth while it is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Uh, which, by the way, I don't want to get too far on a tangent, but that's a really important line. Think about that for a second. All of creation is groaning while it's waiting, not for the return of the king, mind you, but it's waiting, it's groaning while it's waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Or, in other words, it's waiting for the renewal, the whole heart life renewal of God's people that is yet to come. Which, when you think about it, it's really important. Why is it that creation is waiting for that? Not waiting necessarily for the return of the king, though it is. But why is it waiting more for that? Well, it's because we were called to be the caretakers. The cultivators, the stewards of God's creation. All right? Uh, it causes it to flourish according to God's good purpose and design. But the problem is that some of that brokenness out there has infiltrated our own hearts and lives such that when we align ourselves with the things that were not right or with God's spiritual enemies, we fail miserably in our job of being the caretakers and the cultivators of creation. So what is creation longing for? It's the revealing of the renewed, remade children of God. And I just highlight that uh, just to remind us that, that we are people on mission and part of lamenting is lamenting how we oftentimes fail at our purpose and mission because of our sinfulness. Because we align ourselves with the things that are not right and we contribute in our sinfulness to the groaning that is happening in creation in our neighborhoods. Okay, so anyway, creation is groaning. All of creation is groaning as we wait for that future. Uh, And not only creation, the text says, but we too, as we wait eagerly for our full adoption of sons, the resurrection, the redemption of our bodies, Right? Or the, we too, we groan who have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's probably the reason why we groan is because we have the Spirit, which is like the, the, the first fruits, the, the taste of what is yet to come. And so as we can taste that, and we know that we're in a world that's in our bodies, they're not white, made right yet, we long for that, and we groan for what is yet to come. Or the example, the analogy that I've, you probably get sick of me using is when I talk about when I was out in Gettysburg for seven years, and anytime I would try to have a quote-unquote Philadelphia cheesesteak, I would groan. <laughs> Why? Because I, I knew what a real cheesesteak tasted like, and I had that taste that, in, in my mouth. And so when I'm eating these lousy rolls without the, you know, made from the good Philadelphia water or improperly seasoned ribeye steak, whatever it was, I had that other taste in my head, and so I would groan while I'm eating this. That's loosely in the picture here, because we have the spirit, the first fruits of that new life, because we can taste it, and we're not there yet, we groan. And then did you catch what else is groaning, or who else is groaning? Creation's groaning, we're groaning, and that same spirit is groaning as well too. Right? This is perhaps the most uh, encouraging part of this whole passage to me. Right? It, it gives us this picture that we have this fundamental weakness in us, And part of what that fundamental weakness does is it makes us weak prayers. And for anybody who feels that frustration or that weakness in your prayers, such as myself, this is such encouraging news to me that I have the Spirit in me who prays for me in and through my weakness. Who prays to the Father, truer, more perfect, more right prayers when I don't know how I should be praying. And here's the point. What is the Spirit praying? He's interceding for us with what? with groans, too deep for words. Okay, just pick up this picture. All of creation is groaning, we're groaning, and the Spirit who is in us, praying perfect prayers to the Father, is praying deep groans. Right, and so I sort of get the picture here of the Spirit saying, hey, this is great that you are praying prayers of adoration, and you're praying prayers of thankfulness, and you're praying prayers of supplication, asking God to help you through your situations, but... (laughs) If you're not going to sit in discomfort and lament what's going on and pray 
groans. I'll do it for you. I'll groan on your behalf. Uh, Or I imagine the Spirit maybe coming to our worship services and being thrilled that we are singing songs of glory and songs of salvation and songs of freedom and joy and celebration. And I think he's thrilled that we're singing songs of supplication and, and seeking God's help. And then, but I imagine maybe the Spirit then saying, well, wait a minute, that's it? <laughs> you mean you're not going to groan in worship for this creation that's groaning and hurting for families, for relationships? If you're not going to groan, well, then excuse me while I go and groan on your behalf before the Father. See, in other words, I guess I would say this, that part of what lamenting, groaning, recognizing the world that is not right, that we're not there yet, seeing that, seeing in that discomfort and praying that out in prayers of lament and groaning, part of what that is, is simply aligning ourselves and, and joining our voice to the voice of the Spirit. Who groans in this in-between time? It's taking our stand, and this is part of the point, it's taking our stand in solidarity with a groaning creation, with a suffering church, and adding our voice to this sort of collective voice of lament that characterizes, in many ways, the expression of this in-between time. Right? That's the basic idea of lament. That's the basic, um, whatever you want to call it, the push for it. Uh, Actually, I included that Mark passage there. We're not going to spend a lot of time with it, but I, I concluded that, that passage because I think sometimes that maybe is an interesting picture or of what I sometimes think of the church. Right? Here's Jesus, and he's in the garden, and he's about to assume on himself all of that brokenness, all of that injustice, all of that not-rightness of the world and creation and his people. And you can tell his soul is troubled unto death, and he's going to pray. And what does he ask of his disciples? Watch and pray. See what is happening and pray with me. And what do the disciples do? They sleep three times. He comes back to them. Guys, can you not watch and can you not pray with me? Do you see how my soul is troubled? Can you not watch and pray? And because they were tired and whatever, more driven by their comfort or whatever, they they, they kept falling asleep. And sometimes I fear that that's the picture of the church, right? That we are called as God's kingdom of priests, as his intercessors, to watch, to see what is not right, and to lament that, to grieve that, to let it weigh heavy on us, and we bring that to God in prayer, but (laughs) because we want to feel more comfortable and happy and peaceful or whatever, we we, we blissfully fall asleep to all that, and so may it not be so of us, but I wanted to include that as a challenge. Okay, so I gave a bit general idea of what lament is. It's the expression, the cries of this in-between time. I mean, I'll just take a minute or two here and just talk very practically how do we do that. Uh, It's nothing too complex. It's nothing too rocket science. Too much rocket science here. uh, In keeping with that whole kingdom prayer, the way I do it is when we come to that part, Lord, your kingdom come, that's where I'll stop. And I won't just pray that where your kingdom come, but I will stop and and actively maybe consider, okay, (laughs) How is it that that kingdom is being resisted in my home, in my life, in my neighborhood, my community? Right? And I will, this is where I will stop and maybe and, and grieve over that. I will grieve over where, as a family, we have not this past week been aligned to God's purposes. Um, or maybe I will consider our neighborhood, and this is where I'll grieve that you know, there's so many of my, of my neighbors, the majority, vast majority of my neighbors don't know the joy and the freedom that comes through Christ and, you know, are run around, running around chasing after idols, trying to find meaning and purpose and happiness in life. Uh, you know, or here's maybe we would grieve how, how much brokenness in homes and families and relationships exist in our community. Or maybe here's where, you know, coming off of last Sunday night where we heard about some of these you know, systemic injustices that maybe we had never heard about before. That You know, as we consider them and we realize that maybe we actually would grieve and say, my goodness, how can that possibly be that, that here that people would be denied in any, any sort of way equal access to, man, the goodness of God's creation solely based on the color of their skin. And we would grieve that and we would lament that. You know, or maybe this is where you would stop and you would grieve and lament that there are children who are growing up 
with parents who abandon them, or they're growing up in broken homes, or they're growing up in schools that don't have the finances and the resources to provide for a quality education the way maybe our kids do or whatever. Right? So this is a time where we stop and you grieve. And it's just simple. It's not that complex. As we grieve and as we lament that, it stirs in us that longing for that kingdom to come, for God to come and to make that right. And it stirs in us, I, I think, a deeper passion uh, to be a part of that kingdom coming. Right? Uh, or when we get to the part about, um, you know, forgive us our debts. Well, there's where I'm not just going to say forgive me, or I'm just not, maybe not just going to list the, the, my offenses that I'm mindful of throughout the day, but maybe I'm actually going to stop and I'm going to grieve and lament the way my pride and my selfishness has affected my family. Or maybe I'm going to stop and I'm going to grieve and I'm going to lament the way my indifference has kept me from pursuing my neighbors more passionately with the truth of Christ. Or maybe you know, whatever has kept me from being a more faithful servant in the church or the community or wherever it is, right? So when I'm praying, forgive us our debts, I'm, I'm actually lamenting the ways in which I participate with all that is not right. And again, that leads me to more passionately want to seek God's mercy and his grace to help me to change and to grow. Okay? All right, so I'm mindful everybody's wearing masks and you're probably about ready to suffocate from your hot air, so I'm going to wrap this up. (laughs) Uh, So we've talked about what grieving and lamenting is. Uh, We've given you some very practical pointers. I don't need to go too deep in that because it's not rocket science. Don't make it more complex than it is. Just pause, watch, See what's going on and lament it. Let me just close by giving you just a couple other reasons why this is so valuable, uh, so important. Um, sorry, I'm going to look at this. Is this is a problem? I'm not used to preaching in front of people, and so I actually had I actually put out notes here this morning. I don't normally bring out no, up notes with me, but um, I want to look at one thing here. Uh, yeah, well, I'll just say it this way. <laughs> Sorry, Jeffrey. Let me remember, relate it to the, the situation, again, the cultural context that we find ourselves in. Let me, let me just say one more time why I think it's so important for us in this moment, not necessarily to rush into action, but just, just to stop and to grieve and lament. And I would say it this way, that for too long, uh, predominantly white churches in our culture have not been that willing to absorb and to sit in the pain, the frustration of our black brothers and sisters. Part of the reason is stuff we've already talked about before. Maybe you're like me. We're not the best of listeners, especially if I hear anything that remotely sounds like accusation. I want to quick throw up the defenses and rationalize the situation away. Or maybe we don't want to sit and listen to that because it's become so politicized. And so when we hear something, it sounds like, well, that's coming from the left, or that's coming from the right, and I don't give the left or the right the time of day, and so we immediately shut it down and we don't listen to it. Uh, But I guess what I would want to say is that maybe our rush to action... So maybe we've done a good job of actually listening. Maybe we've done a good job of maybe starting to help others say... You understand that we're listening, but a rush to action might be more of the same, same stuff, same unwillingness to actually absorb, to sit in the discomfort that our black brothers and sisters are trying to express and communicate. Right? Or, again, I'll relate it to the situation with Amy. Amy will come to me with an issue, a problem. And on my good days... <laughs> I will not throw up the defenses. I will maybe not be so quick to rationalize the situation, but maybe on my good days, I'll just actually stop and listen. And maybe on my really good days, when it comes time to speak, uh, my initial response is somehow to try to make her understand that I have heard her. Okay? But if you would talk to Amy, who's left, I don't know if she hears this or not. Oh, darn, there she is. If you would talk to Amy, she would tell you probably, okay, that's great that you've heard me, Uh, It's great that you've made me feel heard, but before you rush into action, boy, it sure would be nice if you could just feel something of what I feel. (laughs) Right? If I could actually stand with her, stand alongside of her in her grief, in her frustration, or whatever it is, instead of quick trying to solve the problem so that I don't have to sit in that discomfort. (laughs) Did I get an (laughs) amen? 
I got an amen. You maybe didn't hear that. But again, I think that's so important for us. Before we rush into action, sometimes just sit and lament and grieve. And here's part of the reason why. When we do that, when you stop and you feel, when we empathize with those who suffer and those who hurt, and then we bring that to God in prayer. See, well then, a, a couple of things happen. First of all, like, it allows me to stop and bring before God and make sure that, okay, when, is I, when I move into action, I'm not just moving into action because I want to get rid of my discomfort, but I'm moving into action because I am compelled to see the kingdom come and to be used by God and however he want to, would want to use me. Or when we stop and we lament and we grieve and we bring that to God in prayer, it compels us to come to him in search of his wisdom for how we act Uh, to seek discernment together from him on how we move into the problem, right? So I'm not just moving out into the problem based on my own wisdom or what I think is going to solve this issue. It also, you know, when I bring that to God in lament and prayer, it, it leads me to rely on him for his grace, for his strength as I move in action. All right, so you see the picture. Instead of moving out in action in pursuit of my own comfort, on my own wisdom, on my own strength, now I'm stopping, I'm letting the desire be his kingdom come. I'm leaning on him for wisdom and I'm leaning on him for strength. So that's one of the main reasons. That's why we've got to lament. I would say too, and this is maybe a challenge to us worship leaders, uh, to maybe all of us who maybe if a worship leader would come bringing an actual song of lament and we're not ready for that. It's so good that we lament together because sometimes, probably all of you have been in this place, sometimes people come into into our service and their, the most natural cry and expression of their heart is not joy and celebration, uh, or it's not thankfulness, or maybe it's not even praise. The most natural cry and expression of their heart is lament and grief and cries of despair. And when we don't allow for that voice, it's like we're silencing that voice. Uh, This would be another critique of Carl Truman. I won't read you his big word quote, but he would talk about how he would go around to other churches and evangelical um, groups when he would speak. And he would ask a question. Hey, what can miserable Christians sing when they come to church? And every time he says, he would get that response where everybody would start laughing as if to imply that the church is no place for miserable Christians who would come in real loneliness and real despair and real sorrow and frustration and want to express that in worship. And again, if it is that we are just in love with comfort and peace and happy thoughts, one of the real dangers of that is that we silence those voices and we don't give them the opportunity to express that in worship, nor do we give ourselves the opportunity to stand with them. And that's the final reason. If you ask me, What's the final, maybe most significant reason we need to lament? Is that's our mission? Think about it. Anytime you talk to somebody who's suffering, going through really difficult times, you know, what is your, at least mine, main avenue of encouragement to them? It's partly, yes, we have a great hope, but for right here and right now, my oftentimes main source of encouragement, I want to point their attention to God who is present with them in their sufferings, right? God who uh, is near to them with his grace. So I want to point them to Christ who knows the pain that they're experiencing, who is familiar with their griefs, who is acquainted with their sorrows. I want to point them to the Spirit who is with them in such an intimate way that he is groaning on, on their behalf. Right? That's, the main, that's the main source of comfort that I can give to people, that God is with you in your suffering. So think about it. What is the church called to be? The church is called to be well, we're called to be the, the representation of Christ. We're called to be his ambassadors. We are called to be the presence of Christ in the darkness. We're called to be the, the spiritual household, right? The temple of the spirit ministering to one another. In other ways, look at this. We are called to be the actual presence of God with sufferers. Right? We are called to be sanctuaries of the spirit where the love the care, the compassion of God can be seen and felt. And that only happens when we take our stand alongside people in their hurt and in their discomfort. And when we try to empathize and we actually try to stop, not just to hear it and I say we hear you, but to actually to feel that, to empathize with it and to join with them in lamenting 
uh, and groaning to God. See, this is all part of an overflow of the gospel. Right? The great news of the gospel is that we have one who laments deeply for us. And it was his lament over our condition, our sorrows, that led him to forsake glory and riches in heaven and come and to be born among us, to enter into a darkened world, to assume, to take his stand in solidarity with us, to make our problems his problems, ultimately by suffering sacrificially on a cross. (laughs) It's his lament for us that leads him to be with us now in our suffering and to provide for us grace and spirit to sustain and nurture us. And it's his lament for us that leads him to secure at all costs for us this glorious freedom or this glorious future free of pain and sorrow and sadness. That's gospel. That's, that's, that's what we encourage ourselves with. And so a church that's called to bear witness to that gospel, give testimony to it, and to actually embody that gospel in our life together uh, is a church that is called to see, to understand, and also stand alongside sufferers in their grief and in their frustration, and to add our voice collectively in the voice of lament while we wait on that great and glorious future. So again, I'll end it where I started. If your desire is... Comfort, immediate, instant gratification, comfort, don't lament. It'll lead you down roads of discomfort, uh, feeling the pain of others. But if your desire is your kingdom come, and if your desire is to align yourself with that kingdom, if your desire is to walk near to the king who moves into the darkness, who moves into the pain sacrificially, uh, then it's good for us to stop and lament, to grieve and to groan together together. Uh, in solidarity with a groaning creation, a suffering church, and the Spirit who groans for us. So may God be pleased to do that, work out in us, and to make us a people together that are an even deeper reflection of uh, his great gospel. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we ask it. Amen. Uh, So at this point, as we close out, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll sing a song that um, points us in grief and in hardship, uh, in hope to that great glorious future that we have together. Familiar song. Those of you who are here, why don't we stand together? You at home, I'd encourage you to stand at home as well too. I don't know how you can sing just sitting down all the time. But let's close uh, with a great uh, song, uh, We Will Feast in the House of Zion.